Howdy. I think I'll start this new day with a quote from Henry David Thoreau, and you probably remember this from high school, but he said that a man is wealthy in direct proportion to the number of things he can do without. That's a good motto to live by if you can't afford that Mercedes. Well, today I told you that I'm going to start on the crank here, and I already turned down uh, some aluminum to one and one sixteenth, and I was going to make the crank similar, if not identical, to this one, but I decided for variety I'm going to go another route, because you've already seen me do that, but uh, as I've been building engines over the years, I've made uh, patterns and consequently castings for different types of cranks and here as you can see some and they're kind of a simulated uh, pseudo counterweight uh, type because they're made out of aluminum and just how much counterweight is that but these bigger ones were used for my Stirling engines and then I even had some disc type and notice that I have center holes uh, already punched in there or cast in there and the uh, crank pin holes for different uh, throws but uh, those are a little bigger than what I want to use although this one probably would do nicely but I'm going to use this kind because I got some of these in stock uh, not a whole lot but uh, also cast the uh, center hole and the uh, crank pin hole and that is 3 8 throw which gives me 3 quarter uh, stroke and I want a 3 quarter stroke for this little engine so this one for some reason or another a long time ago I started working on it and didn't finish but I already have uh, an eighth of an inch hole right there so the next thing I will do is uh, drill and ream a 3 16 hole for the uh, main shaft I have indeed went ahead drilled and reamed this hole 3 16 and you know I'm particularly fond of this uh, little two inch drill press vise and matter of fact you've noticed that I have many many vices and in fact vices I guess you could say are one of my vices but this particular vice it's old and I only recently got it but it's made by uh, Yankee and if perhaps you can read that on there perhaps not Yankee Brothers and it's Philadelphia Pennsylvania so this is really an old one and uh, as, as you well know Yankee screwdrivers like this made by North Brothers and well maybe there's some of you who have never seen these what with the advent of uh, electric uh, uh, screwdrivers and and uh, portable drills that allow you to drill screws but for years these were used to drive and remove the reversible I don't know why I'm showing you this, probably nobody interested, but this is also a Yankee made by North Brothers, but Stanley bought them out. You know, Stanley bought a lot of companies out, and this business of companies buying other companies out is not new. It just goes back well over a hundred years, but then later it evolved into this, uh, here's a Stanley, you know, cheap plastic, just total throwaway junk. But these were handy if you were just going to drill a hole uh, for hanging a picture or something. No cords, no batteries needed. And there's millions of these around yet and have uh, virtually no value at all, especially this you know, piece of junk here. All right, sorry I got sidetracked here, but back to this. Now I'm ready. This piece really is done. Ready to install the shaft into and the little uh, uh, crank pin. This could be cut off because I made this long enough so I could uh, change the stroke or the, or the throw, but uh, that extra distance out there isn't going to hurt anything. So I'll cut off a 1 8 inch piece of uh, brass welding rod, brazing rod, and uh, Loctite in there, that in there. And I also will Loctite the shaft in there. Now, if you're not a Loctite fan, there's alternate ways of doing that and that, of course you certainly could put a set screw in there or drive a pin in there but whatever you do when you pin something like this do not uh, drive it into a blind hole that cannot be removed and with the shape here it would be uh, most awkward to drill a cross hole through there because it would end up being too long but you could do that but I believe I'll lock tight that on and then move on to another part of the engine as that Loctite sets. 
I do realize that sometimes I give you way too much information and other times I kind of gloss over things but remember again that we have some young uh, boys doing this that uh, maybe need uh, total instruction from uh, ground one you know some 12 year old boys have never been shown any of this so that's why I go into some of this detail but I know you older guys are uh, pretty adept at a lot of this but uh, there are other ways of doing this now I'm, I told you already that I'm going to lock tight this on some red Loctite but uh, and be sure and clean everything if you are going to use that method and uh, then let it set you know for hours but if you don't have Loctite or you don't Loctite uh, use Loctite and I already told you that uh, that you could press it in there you know uh, uh, use a undersized reamer and press it in there or turn this down such that you can press it in there but that's a lot of work also you can thread this and I've made a lot of engines where I would thread this and tap the hole and screw it in there but I almost guarantee you that it's going to wobble and it's going to be somewhat crooked and if it, but if it's only slightly crooked you put this whole thing in the lathe and face off the end of it and that'll true it up but it'll wobble on the back side but uh, that aside uh, I prefer to do this way because it is going to run nice and true then uh, as far as cutting off material and I'm using brass but it could be steel don't use aluminum though uh, how are you going to cut it off well again this very fine type of cheap boys throw away hacksaw is uh, I don't know how fine that tooth is but it's, it, uh, it's set on that uh, or the, I don't know how fine this blade is but it's certainly finer than 32 which you're going to find in a large hacksaw but so these work great. Also have you noticed that if you have a brand new blade it will cut brass like nobody's business. But if this blade has been used on steel even for just a few cuts it will not cut nearly as well. And the same thing is true with files. It would be nice to dedicate certain blades uh, and files for brass work but of course you're going to get them mixed up and that's not going to happen especially if you're in a shop where there's more than one person I have the luxury of being in a one-man shop so uh, this also could be threaded 540 and tapped 540 and held in in that manner or pressed but again I will use Loctite now when you and I've talked about this before but once you've cut off these pieces and they're small they're hard to hang on to so this type of vise or a pin vise just works great for for uh, taking it and uh, running it on the belt sander and squaring off the end and all such uh, type of small work and the beauty of that is that with brass I've told you that your fingers will be burnt within uh, two seconds that's how fast the heat is conducted in brass and copper compared to steel so I like this type of, of vice I think you can still buy these or you can make your own with a cheap throwaway type chuck the Loctite is at work in the absence of oxygen I've talked about that many times so let me turn my attention now to flywheels and I've talked over and over about these till uh, I'm sure you're sick of it and I'm not going to use this type on this particular engine because I know that you can't use it so let's talk about this type of flywheel and I temporarily borrowed that off of another engine because I had made up several of those and then I got a video showing how to make these and uh, let me uh, show that to you but again you can make virtually any kind of flywheel you want and it's two and a half inches in diameter that's about what you want for this scale of engine I always have the ruler backwards about two and a half inches this is steel it's a, a three-eighths thick there's quite a bit of weight to this as a matter of fact it weighs probably about what the lead flywheel does and again you, you don't want an aluminum flywheel because let's talk about inertia you, you learned about that in seventh grade and uh, we need the inertia of a heavy flywheel the momentum if you will if you want to make a flywheel that has holes in there which in some ways simulates spokes uh, 
you can look at these videos. I've talked about this these before. My Machine Shop Tips 153 through 156 uh, talks about bolt circles. As a matter of fact, I, I am drilling the, the uh, holes in this very flywheel because I borrowed that off of another engine, as I just said. But uh, your flywheel can also look like this. Or just take your two and a half inch stock and uh, face one end, drill a hole, and and uh, you know slice off a section of it, which may not be easy for you guys to do that have smaller lathes, but uh, you, that's a possibility. Uh, you can also uh, you can buy flywheels from uh, various suppliers. Here's another flywheel that I bought at a flea market a long time ago. It's brass, but this apparently came off of a toy steam engine. I'm not totally sure because this is the way I bought it. But the interesting thing about this one is that it has the eccentric machined into the back of it. So the eccentric uh, is not a separate piece. I'm not going to do that, but uh, I think that's pretty neat. We're going to have a, a separate eccentric like this which we're going to be getting into here before very long but this type of thing is available also you might be able to buy uh, small uh, toys in the farm stores little tractors and things where you can uh, throw the toy away and just keep the wheels you know and make a flywheel out of that so there's many possibilities you need a set screw to hold it on to the shaft so this set screw of course is drilled right through and the set screw down here do not drill it through this portion because there's just more possibility of breaking the drill or the tap take the advantage here of the clearance of a hole do the obvious but sometimes we don't do the obvious and I'm no exception while the Loctite is doing its magic I am going to uh, go ahead and start on the piston. Now remember this is a, a 9 16 bore, 3 quarter stroke. So I do not have any 9 16 stock around the shop because you know 9 16 and 7 16 and some of those sizes you just you're not going to have them in, in stock unless you order them and you're, you don't need them very often. So I'll, I'll quickly turn down some 5 8 stock to that size but let me point out this that when I'm working on my models, I have a, a couple different bins here. I think this is maybe a refrigerator bin or something like that, but it's a long and it's handy. Handy as heck. Not long enough for this stock. This stock is uh, 12 inches long, so you can see it doesn't quite fit. But I keep all of the size, smaller sizes that I need in here. I got threaded rod. Some of you call it all thread. I call it ready rod. Uh, you know, there's some half inch brass and, and even some flat stock, but in the bottom here, shorter pieces, I got all kinds of, of uh, brass steel in those little sizes. And that's the first place I look when I'm uh, needing this material. And then furthermore, in other boxes, this box is devoted to, and I'm very strict about this, that there's nothing but tubing in here. This is what I call that hobby tubing that I've talked so much about and I'm a big fan of. So that's all. Oh, somebody put some flat stock in there. I wonder who that was. And a lot of small copper and brass tubing and even some steel. And brake tubing is handy for some of those small uh, steel sizes. And some of this is plumbing. Uh, material but all handy as heck to have and I guess I'm not the only one in the world that does that because when I went to that inventors auction and there was boxes and I bought a lot of this stuff because nobody else wanted it you know that's a dollar box but handier than heck because all of these small sizes of rod and I think some of this is drill rod but it's unidentified although the, the long dead owner uh, had identified it, some of it with tape. But look, we even got some steel that small. That feels like it's spring steel. But between these three bins here, I've got a lot of what I need without leaving my bench. So if you're a pack rat like me, start a collection like that. 
I am now making the piston for the little engine and I've already turned it down so I got a very nice fit in my 9 16 bore. Fits that just perfectly within a half a thousandth. And the next thing I will do is I'm going to take this cutter and it's a uh, sixteenth inch thick that's about sixty two thousandths and I'm going to put a slit in here for the connecting rod. Now you've seen me do that in other videos on the milling machine with this type of uh, cutter and holder and I'm going to do it in the uh, closing lathe now or any lathe for that matter uh, by a slightly different method which I think you'll like because I know that some of you out there do not have milling machines so here's an alternate way of doing it and I've shown you in uh, the last video on building an engine several ways to do it with saws and band saw and so on but here's another way uh, yet to do it now this little arbor here which is a half inch shank and will hold different size cutters and different size uh, cutter or cutters with different size holes in them but I don't know where I got this and, and they're super cheap and they're very poorly made and you're gonna see that the cutters never run true matter of fact this is an eccentric not meant to be that way but uh, whoever made it didn't care so it's very poorly made but it's, it's still gonna do the job however I'm gonna hold the cutter and the arbor in the three jaw chuck and the work will be held in the Aloris tool holder so let's take a look at how I'm going to do that let's take a look at how I made this piston on the original prototype engine here I'm going to take the piston out just by bending the crank uh, or the connecting rod a little bit I'll pull it out and this piston's a little bit shorter than uh, than what I need but I wanted it such that it comes almost to the uh, bottom of the cylinder on the back stroke but in this direction it should not come far enough to where it covers uh, the intake port but I can get by with going a little bit longer than this so I think I'll make mine half inch long and see how it goes this one's only three eighths now the slot is what I'm doing now so the slot needs to be probably a little longer than this this slots only a quarter inch so I'm gonna make the slot uh, about five sixteenths deep now back to talking about uh, how I'm making the slot I already showed you the cutter and this is the 5 8 stock that's been turned down to seven sixteenths and I need to hold it in a, a, a Loris holder this is actually a Dorian but it will not fit in the smaller uh, holder. A 5 eighths will not quite fit in there so I'm using this bigger one hopefully you have one and notice that I used I had a parallel in here to, to move it out so that the set screws were approximately on the center of the work. Also note now I left the nipple on the end for a reason normally you face that off but that defines the center line or the center of the piston or the stock and I will utilize that as soon as I put this back into the lathe so over to the closing we go looking at it from a robin's eye view I have brought the work vertically so that the center of the nipple there is pretty much on the center of the lathe center as far as the height is concerned. Now using the little nipple that I talked about I will move the carriage back and forth once I put my optivizer on and line it up with the center of the cutter. And in that manner I'm going to be pretty darn close to the center because it doesn't matter all that much but an alternate way of doing it of course would be to come in touch off on the side as we've done on the milling machine back it off and move it in you'd have to have an indicator on your carriage and center it that way but since I put the nipple on there and I'm gonna keep this simple that's the way I'm doing my aligning and then I'll turn the machine on and I've installed the cutter such that it will be cutting in the uh, forward position that is uh, looking at it from this way it actually is counterclockwise 
and uh, I, when I touch off then, once the machine is running, I will take note of my uh, reading on the crossfeed dial and then I'm going to feed in a total of uh, what I told you previously. I have to, I got that written down, I got to go over and see how far that was, so, and I'll show that. And since this is a, oh, about a two inch cutter, I have to run it at a relatively slow speed. So let me make those adjustments off camera, and then when I come back, the, the uh, cut will be made. Prior to making a cut like this, or using a cutoff tool, be sure and make sure that your, uh, your tool holder is parallel with the chuck, which makes it perpendicular to the spindle. And if there wasn't work in here and other interferences, I would just bring the uh, lower tool holder right up against the face of the chuck, but since uh, that isn't possible, I use a parallel, and I just bring it uh, up like this, up against the chuck, and then I'm holding it tightly against that, and then tightening this bolt. Now I know it's perpendicular. And I made the cut simply by feeding in like this. The cut is already completed. And I determined uh, the depth this way just by watching my dial indicator, which I have set at the end of the uh, cross slide. <laughs> 